Mike Bryant here again with the third installment of the Origins of Islam. In our last class, we had ended with Muhammad fleeing the city of Mecca to take refuge in the village of Yathrib. And if you'll remember, the people of Yathrib were having internal struggles, internal fighting, and they were looking for somebody to come in and help solve their problems, act as sort of a peacemaker. So they had invited Muhammad uh, at the behest of a few kind of secret Muslims uh, in their midst who were lobbying on Muhammad's behalf. And remember that there was bad blood between Yathrib and Muhammad's home city of Mecca. Mecca was the home of the Kaaba, and uh, the Kaaba claimed this relationship to uh, the biblical story of Abra Abraham and uh, his son Ishmael through the slave girl Hagar, uh, and that Abraham and Ishmael had built the Kaaba. Uh, up in Yathrib, there was a significant population of Jews who kind of poo-pooed this idea this notion that there was any connection between the Kaaba, uh, which, how, which housed a lot of pagan icons, and the biblical uh, patriarch Abraham. So the fact that Muhammad was fleeing to Yathrib uh, was a source of angst among the Meccans, and uh, they were not happy about it. So in today's section, we're going to talk about Madame. Muhammad in Yathrib, and the first topic is how Muhammad kind of settled the problems that these different, these eight tribes in Yathrib were having, keeping peace among themselves. And he came up with a system of government that has come to be called the Constitution of Medina. And now is a good time to explain why the name of the, the town changed from Yathrib to Medina. Um, ultimately, it's going to become famous as the city of the prophet Muhammad, and that is literally what Medina means in Arabic. It's a contraction for the words city of the prophet. Okay, So the first principle of this constitution that Muhammad establishes is that there's a new ummah, a new community in uh, Medina, in Yathrib, that is comprised of the original eight tribes, the five Muslim tribes and the three Jewish tribes, and the new Muslim community, the, the guys from Mecca who had followed Muhammad to Medina. A second principle of the Constitution of Medina is that God's protection extends not just to the citizens of Medina and the Muslim community, but also to any Jews or other, quote, people of the book, Christians, who might happen to find themselves in Medina. A third principle of the Constitution is it replaces the blood feud, which, as we saw in Mecca, was how you kind of maintain the peace. In other words, if somebody from my tribe gets killed by somebody from your tribe, there's an obligation on my tribe's part to avenge that death and kill somebody on in your tribe. Okay. Well, Muhammad understands that this just ends up being creating a cycle of violence. So he replaces the blood feud with what is called the blood white. In other words, you can atone for a murder through payment of money instead of a payment of blood. The Constitution establishes a tax system. Everybody's going to pay in, and that money is used to pay for Medina's defense, building defensive structures, as we're going to see, hiring mercenaries if need be, and so forth. The Constitution also provides for protections for women. Women are protected under this political system, which is novel in uh, Arabia at this time. And it establishes a judicial system for resolving disputes. So we're not just going to fight it out if we've got a dispute anymore. There's going to be a new rational, orderly process for doing so. Once Muhammad had established the political order in Medina, then he turned to establishing kind of the, the 
cadence of his new religion. And the weekly cycle revolves around Friday prayers. And it's interesting that he chose Friday. Uh, he might have chosen Saturday as the Sabbath, but the practice in Medina was that Saturday was the market day. That was the day off from work for most of the laborers, and they would use Saturday to go and do their shopping and so forth. So rather than try and disrupt that natural existing uh, practice, Muhammad built his uh, religious calendar kind of around that and made Friday the, the basically the worship day for his for Islam. At this time, Muhammad has established himself as an authority figure, figure, and he's obviously got a lot of followers who have followed him to Medina. He starts to convert a lot of the native Medinan pagans to his new religion, and it's gaining strength. Much of our story today is going to involve the relation between Muhammad and the Jews of Medina. Okay. So it's important to understand, we've said this a couple times, that there are eight Jewish tribes that make up Medina. Three of them are Jewish. Okay, And there's kind of an odd relationship between the three Jewish tribes and the five uh, Arab tribes in Medina. The Jews control all of Medina's arable land and therefore most of its wealth. Okay, But they really don't have enough numbers or political power to offset the Arabs. So they're really politically dependent on their Arab tribesmen. Muhammad initially, when he arrives in Medina, believed that the Jews were going to welcome him as a prophet and probably as the Messiah. He felt like he was actually getting revelations from the Jewish God and fully expected them to accept that fact. Uh, unfortunately, he is sadly mistaken in that. Even though he adopts some of the Jewish religion, uh, Jewish holidays, including Yom Kippur, and tries to assimilate them into the new Islamic faith that he's building. The, the rabbis there among the Jews quickly ridicule Muhammad, and when Muhammad tries to set up a tent in the marketplace, the Jews tear it down. So relations sour very quickly between Muhammad and the Jews of Medina. The other big theme of today's uh, lesson is the war between Medina and Mecca, between the Muslims and Mecca. Remember that Muhammad and his followers had fled Mecca and they had been in a community there inside of Mecca before they had to flee to Medina. After they left, the Meccans seized all their property, right? confiscated their land, confiscated the goods that they had left behind, and basically said, you're not getting them back. In retaliation for this, the Muslims decide to raid a, a Meccan caravan, trading caravan, that is making its way past Yathrib or past Medina, and uh, Muslim, Muhammad actually leads some of these raids. And if this sounds like it doesn't quite comport with the you know, peaceful tenets of Islam, Muhammad gets additional revelations as recorded in the Quran that this raiding activity is, is, has been sanctioned by Allah because the Meccans have acted wrongly and persecuted Allah's followers in Mecca. The Meccans, uh, for their part, retaliate against the Muslims by denying them access to the Kaaba during the annual Hajj. And so the Muslims take it up one notch in response, and they actually attack a caravan on its way to Mecca during the Hajj, thereby violating the peace of God. Remember, that was a central part of the Hajj, was that everybody lays down their swords during the period of the Hajj. Well, the Muslims have violated this. And again, um, there's a revelation where Allah basically sanctions this and says that denying the Muslims access to the Kaaba is worse than violating the peace of God. Okay, Now, 
Muhammad's role in, in these various uh, raids, whether he actively participates or not, is that he's kind of the leader of the community and therefore he takes a 20% cut of the spoils of all of these raids, whether he participates or not. The Meccans eventually get pretty sick of this uh, raiding of their caravans and they decide to take vengeance on Muhammad. So they kind of lay a trap for Muhammad. Muhammad and his raiders are trying to ambush a caravan and what they find is that instead the Meccans have followed up with a significant force which pursues Muhammad and his uh, followers and they outnumber them three to one so it's looking pretty grim for Muhammad and his raiders. Surprisingly though Muhammad does not order his forces to retreat or flee but rather chooses to stand and fight and defiantly or confidently says that Mecca has quote sent us the best morsels of her liver and his charisma is such that even the non-Muslim followers from Medina who are with him decide to stand by his side in this battle. So as it turns out, Muhammad and his followers win this battle, the Battle of Badr, which takes place in the year 624 by our calendar. And this turns out to be huge for Muhammad. This really puts him on the map, uh, so to speak. His prestige throughout Arabia soars because this is a militaristic society, right? And so he finally gets his credibility among these various Bedouin tribes through winning a military battle, okay? And against such odds shows either his brilliant generalship or, more importantly, the fact that God favors him and kind of vindicates everything that he's been saying uh, with respect to his new religion. Maybe he really is the prophet of the most powerful Allah. Okay? It's after the, the Battle of Badr that the two threads of our story start to intertwine. The, the war between Mecca and Medina on the one hand and Muhammad's relations with the Jews of Medina on the other. So after the Battle of Badr, Muhammad and his followers kind of came back to Medina enriched with the spoils of the army of Mecca that they had just defeated. And so they were ready to kind of flash their wad, so to speak, and, and spend it. And so they one of the, the wives of one of the warriors that was involved in this battle went to the tent of a goldsmith who was a member of one of the three Jewish tribes. I'm going to just call it Tribe One uh, for simplicity's sake. So this, this Muslim woman goes to the tent of a, gold, a Jewish goldsmith from the first Jewish tribe in Medina. Okay, and she wants to buy some jewelry, right? So this guy kind of looks down on the Muslims for being, you know, Jewish pretenders. Remember, Muhammad is claiming to be the prophet of the Jewish God, and the Jews are having none of this, right? So they don't like the Muslims. So this this Muslim woman is in there for the purpose of, of buying gold jewelry, and this merchant is pretending like he's, you know, friends with her and he's he's going around you know putting necklaces on her and what she doesn't realize is that as he's kind of fumbling with her and, and putting bangles on her wrists and and earrings on her ears and whatnot he surreptitiously pins her clothing to the chair that she's sitting in so when she stands up her clothing ends up getting torn off her body and she's, you know, exposed and humiliated and, you know, everybody's pointing and laughing, right? And uh, laughing most of all is the, is the Jewish goldsmith for the trick that he's played. Well, in retaliation for this, Muhammad and his Muslim followers lay siege to the entire Jewish tribe who kind of occupy a cohesive quadrant there in the city. And the, and the Jews understand the mistake they've made um, because they're outnumbered and they've got this great military leader, Muhammad, uh, against them. And it's at this point where Muhammad wants, you know, 
nothing but blood. He wants to kill these guys for what they've done. Um, and another member of Medina intervenes and convinces Muhammad, don't kill them, just expel them, kick them out of the city as punishment for what they've done. And this character comes down to us in, in Islamic lore with the interesting title of leader of hypocrites for what he did uh, in this episode. Okay, so back to the war between Medina and Mecca. Okay, The Meccans are stinging from their defeat at the Battle of Badr. They're already itching for revenge, and now we get a person from a, the second Jewish tribe in Medina who kind of goads them further. This is a, a poet in the, the Jewish tribe who's famous for his kind of sarcastic, um, satirical poems that he writes, and so he's coming up with all these poems, making fun of the Meccans for getting beaten by this, you know, this uh, fake Jew Muhammad, if you will, and word is getting around the Meccans are becoming a laughing stock as a result of their defeat at the Battle of Badr. So what they do is they send uh, a leader of their city up to Medina to kind of reconnoiter. And this is where relations between the Jews and the Muslims deteriorate even further. This second Jewish tribe, the tribe that, that claims this, this naughty poet who's been provoking them, um, this same Jewish tribe houses this guy from Mecca when he comes up to kind of survey the situation up there and gain intelligence on how the Meccans can defeat Muhammad and his forces. Okay, So this leader goes back to Mecca thinking he understands the uh, weaknesses in uh, Muhammad's army and the, the strategic situation and he returns with an army of 3,000 intent on destroying Muhammad once and for all. The battle takes place at a place called Ahud uh, in the year 625. Right? And so Muhammad and the Muslims, when they see this giant Meccan force approaching, decide God is on their side. We've been outnumbered before. They're going to attack instead of uh, playing defense, which they do. And in fact, they initially are winning the battle. And they're winning so handily that some of Muhammad's followers get out of control. And before the battle is completely finished, they start looting the uh, Meccan camp. Well, because they've kind of turned their attention away from the battle at hand, they don't see a Meccan counterattack with cavalry that takes advantage of the situation and turns the tide of the battle. Muhammad and his followers, the Muslims, are actually driven onto the hillside where they can kind of make a better defensive stand against the attacking Meccans. And what the Meccans do, instead of trying to attack uphill um, against the, the, these unfavorable odds, they start desecrating the corpses of the Muslim soldiers who have fallen on the battlefield below. And they actually mutilate the bodies of these uh, these fallen soldiers, cutting off their ears and their noses, and then turning them into anklets that they tie around their ankles. And the, the wife of the Meccan general actually tries to eat the liver of one of these fallen soldiers. This gives you an idea of just how vicious and the, the level of hatred between these two sides has become. This is, there's no quarter given between uh, the Muslims and the Meccans. After the battle, Muhammad gets a revelation which kind of explains why they had lost. There were a couple of reasons for this according to the revelation. Number one, the battle was a punishment for the Muslim sinfulness and also a test of Muslim resolve, right? It can't be all good things all the time. Okay, so the, the Battle of Uhud, the, the defeat, leads to the next episode between Muhammad and the Jews. Um, remember the bad poet who had kind of goaded the Meccans into uh, attacking 
Medina, right? Well, now he's at it again. And the Jews are emboldened by Muhammad's loss. So now he's writing erotic poems about Muslim women, okay? Which infuriates Muhammad, infuriates the other uh, Muslim men, and they determine that they're going to assassinate the bad poet, which they do. Um, even though he lives in kind of a fortified compound and is pretty much invulnerable, four uh, Muslims pretend to be defectors. One of them is actually this guy's foster brother, and they kind of convince this guy that it's safe to, to come out, and when he does, they assassinate him. So now the Jewish tribe, in vengeance, plots to assassinate Muhammad, and Muhammad gets wind of this plot. He and his followers lay siege to the second Jewish tribe, and as punishment, they expel the second Jewish tribe, who happens to be the, the, the major landowning tribe in, uh, in Medina. And after they're expelled, Muhammad and his followers divide up their land and their wealth. And this kind of gives the Islamic faith, the, the new Muslim church, financial independence for the first time. They've got a base of financial support beyond, you know, the temporary wealth they get from raiding uh, caravans from Mecca. All right, so now it's time to go back to the war between Mecca and Medina, right? We've got basically a tie so far. The Muslims won the first battle, the Battle of Badr. The Meccans won the second battle, the Battle of Uhud. But it wasn't a decisive victory because they didn't kill Muhammad. But they're emboldened. They're stock is rising high in Arabia, so now they feel like they can land the killing punch. And they assemble an alliance amongst Mecca and a bunch of Bedouin tribes numbering 10,000 people. And among these uh, are those exiles that Muhammad had just driven out of Medina, that second Jewish tribe, okay? So they've got a personal stake in this similar to what the Meccans have. Now, when the, when the Muslims in Medina find out about this gigantic army that is uh, headed their way, they realize that they can't, you know, attack the way that they typically done. The odds are just too heavily against them. So they're gonna have to fight a defensive war. And this is where something, where Muhammad does something that uh, really, again, shows his military genius. He does something that seems logical and, and obvious to us, but was brand new in military tactics in Arabia at that time. He digs a defensive trench, right? Because he's heard that the, the army coming from Mecca is largely comprised of cavalry. And the way you, you defeat cavalry is you slow them down. Okay, so he digs this defensive trench, which apparently had been an idea whispered in his ear by a follower from as far away as Persia, who had seen this tactic used. Likewise, the citizens of Medina realize that uh, this army is on the way, and they harvest their crops early. They bring them in from the fields outside the city, and as we're going to see, that's going to have important consequences for the battle that follows. The Meccans and their allies had counted on a kind of a shock and awe uh, strategy to overwhelm the Medinans rapidly with their cavalry. And when they get there and they encounter this trench, their whole strategy goes up in flames. And furthermore, now that it, this battle is going to settle down into a siege, the cavalry that they brought that they thought was going to be, you know, give them this decisive advantage actually becomes a liability. Because in a siege, the horses don't do you any good. In fact, they're just additional mouths to feed. And here again, we see the interweaving between Muhammad's relations with the Jews and this war between Mecca and Medina. Because remember that two of the three Jewish tribes have been expelled. That third Jewish tribe is still there in Medina. 
And Muhammad had made a pact with these guys to let them exist peacefully, you know, all bad blood uh, notwithstanding. But the Jews start to waver when they see this gigantic army uh, headed their way and possibly are thinking, this is our chance to kind of free ourselves from the yoke of Muhammad. Um, and so they start to parlay with the Meccan alliance. And it's a serious enough threat that Muhammad is forced to dispatch 400 of his men to keep an eye on the Jews living in their midst to make sure that they don't uh, mount some kind of a sneak attack uh, from behind. At this point, Muhammad demonstrates that he can be a KG uh, diplomat as well as a shrewd military technician. He starts to drive a wedge into the alliance, uh, which again is comprised of a bunch of different Bedouin tribes, the Meccans who are never going to um, you know, negotiate with Muhammad, and the Jews there inside Medina, right? Well, Muhammad reaches out to some of these Bedouin tribes who are really just there for, you know, the spoils, and kind of offers to make a separate peace with them. After they tentatively come to an agreement, the rest of the, the council in Medina doesn't ratify it, so nothing really comes of it except the fact that it starts to, st to sow distrust among the alliance. The Meccans see that these, these parlays had happened. They're wondering, are our allies really going to be there at the end of the day? So the whole alliance is starting to crumble. Muhammad also manages to in, employ a secret agent in the alliance, a mole, if you will. And what he does is he gets this mole to approach that second Jewish tribe that's part of the alliance and convince them that, you know, the rest of the Arabs aren't really on their side and that they should, in order to ensure their safety after the battle is won, that they should ask for some hostages from the other tribes, people that, you know, they can have in their custody and prevent the other tribes from attacking them for fear that the Jews will, you know, kill the hostages, uh, which is a common practice in this age and, and really in ancient times in general for ensuring good behavior uh, and solidifying an alliance, okay? So the mole first convinces this Jewish tribe to ask for hostages, but then he goes to the other Muslim tribe, or no, it's Arab tribes rather, and tells them that the Jews are going to ask you for hostages so that they can hand them over to Muhammad and give him a, a chip in the game against you. So the Jews are planning to betray you. And again, Muhammad, through the use of this secret agent, this mole, further degrades the bonds tying together this, this loose confederation, this alliance that's arrayed against him. Before too long, the weather itself starts to help Muhammad and uh, the citizens of Medina. It starts to turn cold and rainy, uh, miserable weather to conduct a siege in. And furthermore, the alliance, the Meccans and their allies, had not counted on a siege. So they didn't bring any supplies with them, or not many, not enough, not enough to, to withstand a long siege, certainly. And remember that the Medinans had had the foresight to go out and harvest their crops so they can't forage for food either. So now many of the allies, these Bedouin tribes, start to get really restless. This is not what they signed up for. We came for fast plunder, not to sit here in the cold and the rain and hunger. Finally, after enough time has gone by, the alliance completely falls apart. The Bedouin allies withdraw and Meccan prestige is shattered as a result of this. They had they had gone all out to bring in all these allies with all these lavish promises of, of great plunder and glory, and it all came to nothing, right? So now they're the laughing stocks of Arabia. Muhammad and the Muslims, by contrast, have gained an aura of invincibility. You can't beat these guys. Even when you manage to defeat them as you did at a hood, you can't 
kill Muhammad. Okay, so Muhammad comes out stronger than ever. And of course, who's left holding the bag in the worst position is that third Jewish tribe there in Medina that had flirted with the idea of betraying Muhammad during the Battle of the Trench. So at, in the aftermath of the battle, Muhammad and the Muslims take their revenge on the third Jewish tribe in Medina. They lay siege to the Jews for a full 25 days until the Jews have no choice but to surrender. And if they were expecting any mercy, they're not going to get it. Muhammad has all of the men beheaded and sells all of the women and children into slavery. So Muhammad has won the war between Mecca and Medina and eliminated all of his Jewish uh, enemies there in Medina. In our final episode next week, we're going to talk about Muhammad's final days and what follows in the death of Muhammad.